like to introduce David Brill. Um, and David is uh, from the Attorney General's office in the healthcare division, I believe. Your division. Division. Um, and as I said, uh, the Attorney General's office is, is going through a pro process of revising the guidelines and uh, just starting. And uh, it's best David to come and talk, talk with us a bit about what the process is going to be. Uh, and maybe answer some questions, or at least understand what our questions are that we'll want answers to. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank Good you for, for having us here. Um, I'm sorry that my colleague, Alana Brooke, couldn't be here. Uh, she, she put in a lot of work on this project, and I know she was, she was excited to come. Um, but I'm happy to be here in her stead. Um, and as David said, um, I'm here to provide a brief update on where the Attorney General's office is on uh, the setting up an advisory task force on our community benefits program to hopefully re revise and update our guidance. Uh, so I don't have quite as much substance as David presented on the DON uh, process because we're just at the beginning. We had our first meeting of the advisory task force yesterday. Um, so just some, some background before we get into it. On, on slide two, um, you'll see a timeline of the evolution of community benefits reporting in Massachusetts. I know most of you in the room are very familiar with the history of community benefits, so I won't go into too much detail. I will note that even before 1994, when Massachusetts got involved in community benefits, the IRS really initiated this concept of community benefits back in the 1950s and 60s in relation to the granting of tax exempt status for hospitals. Um, and recently, much of the effort has again been on the federal side. Um, with respect to new IRS regulations, um, but of course states have their own interest in monitoring the value and impact of community benefits provided by charitable nonprofit organizations. We obviously know our local populations and needs best, and we have a strong interest in promoting healthier communities, and this is one tool in that toolkit. Um, as David said, DPH has invested significant efforts in updating its DON CHI standards. Um, I'll note that other agencies in government handle the tax exemption side for these organizations, but we hope that the information and transparency provided through the Attorney General's process uh, may help inform their work as well. There have been obviously significant advances in community benefits thinking since our initial guidelines in the 90s and even since our updates in 2009, and we want to respond to those advances in this current round of updates. Um, the next two slides provide a roadmap for the work that we hope to engage in. Um, the advisory task force goals, um, this is just initial thinking, you know, policy and development, these will evolve as we go through the process. Um, but the first is aligning our community benefits program with related programs. Um, as I said, the IRS recently updated its approach to creating a new national minimum standard and we should definitely get aligned with those technical definitions, categorizations, and instructions where appropriate for our state. Um, I'll note the CHI program has, includes approximately 15 to $20 million uh, of funding available per year, um, and, and we should certainly be aligned with DPH around shared population health goals identified um, both by DPH and the institutions and their communities as priorities. Um, and, and we should make sure that we have the benefit of the best evidence based mind in designing interventions going forward. <coughs> um, on number two, as David said, accountable care is where we're all headed, and it's all about breaking down silos. Um, the recent federal guidelines permit uh, joint chinas and implementation strategies, and we think it's time that our community benefits guidelines reflect that as well. <coughs> As, as you heard earlier, um, DPH has wonderful standards for community engagement that govern its CHI program. Those standards were developed over the course of more than a year of engagement with stakeholders who believe in this room and beyond. Um, it's administratively burdensome and works across purposes to have competing sets of standards governing related programs. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We support the work that DPH has done, and we think they did a great job, especially on the community engagement side. 
So we want to get alignment um, in our community engagement standards across these related programs. Um, and last but not least, we want to think about how we best learn from what these organizations are trying. We want to attain clear, comparable data on results and analyze and move away from what's not working and promulgate what is. Of course, it's not the nature of public health to have final, correct solutions. Um, success to us means that we've had a meaningful conversation and put some concrete advancements in place with respect to our guidelines. Um, I will note one, one initiative is briefly getting the state priorities that are in our current community benefits guidelines, which reflect the reflect DPH's thinking back in 2009. And so we're going to look at DPH's uh, six priorities that they've mentioned and, and consider adopting those as well. Yes? Uh, so how are you going to make the draft assessment available to the general public or to providers in that local area? So if you're um, assessing how well that program did, how do we know about it? So part of the transparency going forward is that we think we can do a better job publicizing the programs that these organizations are, are engaged in and analyzing the results. We don't think it's the Attorney General's office job to analyze those results. We're a law office, right? Primarily what we do is law enforcement. This, this public health initiative is, you know, it resides in our office because we have some authority overseeing charities, but the public health experts are really in DPH at, um, within Chinaz, uh, within other community advocacy groups. We want to try to set up a process through which the organizations themselves and these other experts can analyze the programs that are being put in place and create data that can be shared among the organizations going forward. So it's, 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 you know, we don't have a concrete answer yet, but we think it's important to set up an organization and a process that can, can fill that role. Yeah, so that data could become important later on down the road for those of us that write grants yes. and, and want you know, to leverage other monies. But I've never ever seen any, any um, you know, over, I've been doing DON and work for a really long time, and I don't think I've ever seen an assessment that, you know, that was comprehensive and you could easily get to and gave me any information that I wanted to read. Right, right, right now, I, I think the, the assessment is left up to the individual organizations, um, and, and there's not a lot of oversight or sharing of that assessment between organizations and with the community. And, and we think the process can, can do a better job on that going forward. Thank you. Um, so on slide four, you'll see the proposed timeline. We had our first meeting yesterday. Um, this shows you how the topics are sequenced over the next seven months. Um, but while we expect to cover these topics, we expect also the discussion to be flexible and incorporate creative ideas that come from the, the task force members and also other people who are, are paying close attention to the process. Our ultimate goal is to circulate new guidelines in time for next year's reporting, which opens in the spring. Um, and we'd also like to spend some time early next year um, possibly holding some informal training sessions or workshops uh, for organizations that were not able to follow developments over the course of the task force. Um, and then finally, uh, the last uh, slide, you'll see the list of task force members. Um, we feel there's a pretty broad representation of community benefit program participants, uh, community representatives, and public health experts and agencies. Um, just for your reference, for scheduling purposes, a few of these members have identified alternatives, uh, alternates uh, in, in the event that they're unable to attend. Uh, Unit X team will be uh, the alternate for Maddie Rappel, uh, Holly O for Maisha Mr. Jordan at uh, Dimmick Center, and Monica Roll for Doug Brown.
Um, as I said, I think a lot of the uh, guidelines that DPH adopted will make sense for our guidelines as well, community engagement, health, statewide uh, health priorities. Um, as, as you noted, a lot of uh, the actual procedures in the DON, the new DON process are yet to be established because no one has gone through the new DON yet. Um, so I think a lot of building on the concrete steps will depend on how that process shapes out in the next year as, as we see DOS go through that process. Um, and I think the alignment in the procedure will depend a lot on the input we get from the, the health experts on the task force. It's not something we thought about in advance. Yes, David? Um, I know that in the past, um, uh, basically free care um, you know, for care for people who don't have any uh, reimbursement has been counted as a community benefit. And is that something that's going to be up for discussion? Um, how does that work? So everything is up for discussion. I don't envision free care um, discontinuing as a category of community benefit. I understand it's a different, it's a different type of community benefit, right? It's, it's inside the four walls of the medical and, and the updates we're really talking about are creating programs outside of the four walls to address the, the six health priorities. Um, the IRS recognizes free care as a community benefit on its, on its schedule. That doesn't mean we will automatically follow what the IRS does, but it is consistent with what we've done historically. I will note in 2015, we saw for the first time that over half of the reported community benefits expenditures by hospitals were for community benefits programming instead of free care. So we, we have seen with federal reform that free care is decreasing while expenditures on, on other programs are increasing. We don't think, I don't think it will make sense to stop recognizing the charity care, um, but it, it's not the bucket of expenditures that we're really focusing on in the process. Yes. Do you see a future for that came up yesterday. Um, we do. We, we think it's an important initiative. Uh, it was a contentious issue at the federal level. I believe it got included as sort of a below the line optional reporting um, category that's not technically included in community benefits. And we will be discussing on the task force whether it makes sense in Massachusetts to include that expressly as a qualifying Do you think that would be a ready for a rollout? Sorry? Do you think that would be a ready for rollout in DC? I think it could be. Yeah. I think it's considered under which is different than the so I think federally housing is included under the community building category, which you can count as a community benefit under the IRS. And I think that's one Right. Yeah, I think there are there's one category that's community benefits initiatives that are related to the health needs included in the Chenong, and then there's another category, community building, which can include housing, but those are considered outside of community benefits initiatives. And I'm not I'm not sure why why it's split up that way, but but it's it's certainly something we're we're going to look at and see if it makes sense to move some of those categories. But at, at the same time, we do want to reduce what administrative burden we can on the reporting. I have another question, um, which since I uh, don't believe anybody in this room is on the advisory uh, committee, um, if people want to weigh in on any of the issues listed here, what's the best way to do that? Um, you can talk to me after when we break for lunch. Uh, if you have a business card, I'd love to have it, um, and we will get in touch. Uh, but if somebody, uh, if, if you're not getting in touch, if somebody wants to reach out, who would, would they reach out to you? or? I, I think Alana will be the right front person on that. And you, you have Alana's contact. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. We'll, we'll get that. Yeah. Um, and we can get that out to everybody. 
you know, it, it is now a matter of you start competing with the people that are sitting at your table for funding. It's a great comment. Um, I will note <coughs> that as, um, as it's a voluntary program, we don't have authority to tell organizations exactly how to spend their community benefits expenditures. Um, but the, the discussion has already concluded <coughs> whether it even makes sense for these individual organizations to be the filers, and we really need to be thinking about the community as a whole. And if you're coordinating organizations within a community, you're going to have to have some entity coordinating that assessment and that reporting. I don't know whether that's a Chana in certain communities or you know, a government agency in other communities or just a coalition among organizations um, themselves, but it is part of the discussion going forward. And if, you know, if it's an outside entity, obviously they will need some funding in order to, to perform the uh, activities that have previously been done by the individual organizations themselves. So in the, in the CLN, um, guidelines as part of the statewide initiative portion uh, that talk about uh, chip coordinating organizations. If you're a functioning Chana that operates, you know, that you do the health planning and uh, improvement, uh, you would fall into that category and maybe eligible to get some, apply for funding through the statewide Right. It's the DON only is it's unstable funding for yes. reasons that we all sort of can understand. It's, uh, the, the community benefit requirement is a voluntary requirement, as you suggest. Um, so uh, we can all hope and pray and yeah. assume, frankly, that something happened, but but it's not consistent. It's not a stable, stable, um, strategic plan. <laughs> So, uh, and yet it, it's seen to be critical to health reform, which I personally, I believe it is. So it, anyway, I, it's a comment. I, I, don't, I don't imagine you have the answer yet, but it's, it's something that has to be just figured out. Yeah, but I, it's a great comment. I appreciate it, and it, it will be part of the discussion. Any last questions or comments for David? Yes. So community benefit money, I, I don't quite understand why the same hospital system at different hospitals will give different money into their community and that there isn't a standardized thing. It seems that the organization that runs the hospital sort of has this overriding right to decide your community is going to get money and your community is not going to get money and you're going to get more, you're going to get less. So I don't understand why that's not standardized. It seems very unfair and it seems like it could also lead to all kinds of isms. Um, by leaving out different aspects of the community. It's a, it's a great point. Um, I, I think at this point, a lot of the discretion is left up to the reporting organizations to assess their health needs. And I, I think it's worth thinking about um, whether there should be additional standardization between how different health systems do that analysis. Because they're really right. Right. But there's certainly no, no one size fits all in, in this. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody should get some people.
I don't want to put David in the position of standing between us and mine any longer. So thank you very much. One more question. What? I want a quick question. So listening to this and to add to what we need to say something else, um, shouldn't it be like a policy or some sort of a guideline that the hospital should be following uh, in order to distribute those funds fairly by category to all to us and so they each get the same amount when they approve the request? So the 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 Attorney General's guidelines are not directly related to Shana organizations. That's more a DPH uh, creation, and they you know, they have specific funding available. Whereas the Attorney General's office's guidelines don't talk about specific pools of funding or um, specific initiatives that have to, have to be uh, uh, addressed by by hospitals. So I don't think in, in our guidelines we would. So when, for instance, when the Cape had uh, the GUN funds, no other Chana could have access to those funds. Just the Cape and Arts, that's it. So other Chana's couldn't request anything out of that. So let's just remember that the determination of need process and community benefits are separate, separate processes. I think the challenge for us as community health network areas is to engage with the hospitals about their process for decision making about community benefits. And in, in my perspective, um, the deter in the last couple of years, the determination of need process has been a more open process than it used to be. The community benefits process in most hospitals, I think, is a very closed process. And so that I see on the schedule, that's one of the issues that uh, this task force is going to advise. Right. We, we want to build on the open process that, yeah. that DON has established. And some hospitals, the, the committee that decides community benefits is made up of all hospital employees. And, you know, maybe a few residents. Uh, so I think depending on the hospital, it's going to be important to engage them about what their process is going to be sort of insert ourselves into the process. Right. And because it's a voluntary program, it's important to convince hospitals that it's the right way to go to, to take it back off of the DON process. All right, it's time for lunch. What I'd like to encourage you to do is uh, think about people who got introduced, and if there's somebody who's doing something that interests you, have lunch with them. Please, sir. And if you do not, I what you think.